Perfect. Hi, everyone. It's me again, uh, Claire Eigenbroad. Uh, my internship is over, but you can't get rid of me that easily. Uh, so I'm back with another installment. Uh, kicking off season five, I had no idea, but uh, welcome to season five, Backyard Naturalist. Uh, uh, I originally thought of this topic as a Pride Month installment uh, in that we were just booked out already, uh, but every month is Pride Month for me, so no time like the present for, but I'm a seagull, uh, but I'm a cheerleader. If anyone hasn't seen that film, it's a perfect companion to this presentation. It's like 80 minutes long, super campy, like 90s comedy, and it's on YouTube. Um, and uh, this lecture is primarily about homosexuality in the animal kingdom and just a heads up that because of the nature of it I would rate it like a very clinical like very ecological PG-13 it's not going to be graphic but maybe be PG-13 if you're a, a seagull or a banana slug uh, so uh, I just want to uh, make sure uh, that's clear um, but without further ado change the slide okay uh, in 2003, an image, not exactly this one, but an image a lot like this one of two Western gulls on Santa Barbara Island off the coast of California, caring for a little tiny brown pom-pom of a chick was included in an amicus brief that was provided to the US Supreme Court. It played a part in a very landmark decision. Uh, the decision was Lawrence v. Texas, uh, which ruled that punishment for adult non-procreative consensual sex was unconstitutional. So it, uh, it um, uh, got rid of the anti-sodomy laws in Texas uh, and elsewhere in, in the country. Um, and the seagulls were there because they were both female seagulls caring for this chick together. And the brief was explaining how homosexuality is common in the animal kingdom and is a natural part of life on this planet. And I'm starting with this human story in part to just emphasize that thinking about animals as gay is very human centric, just like most, just like anything that we're talking about within ecology, we just can't help it. So we have no idea how animals think about themselves in terms of gender and sexuality. They probably don't think of themselves as gay or bisexual. Um, they are just themselves. This is also um, a, a challenge with historians uh, of human history uh, because it's really difficult to determine how a person would have thought of themselves before our, our modern conceptions of, of gay or trans or um, any of these these labels. Um, so just want to establish that. And then um, we do just tend to project their own views about the world onto other creatures. Uh, but I also want to emphasize this because the those seagulls, the discovery of them was a turning point in the study of homosexual animals and of queerness in the animal kingdom. Uh, so in 1977, uh, pair of biologists who were also a married couple named Molly and George Hunt observed that 14% of the female seagulls on Santa Barbara Island were forming homosexual pairings. So one or both of them would mate with a male and then they would couple up with a female seagull instead. Uh, they would simulate mating with each other and then they would incubate and raise their chicks together once they laid their eggs. Uh, and this study was published at a time, it was eight years after Stonewall, is a time when queer folks were becoming more visible and starting to demand uh, more rights. Uh, and as a result, there was also a lot of pushback from anti-gay activists like Anita Bryant. Uh, Anita Bryant and her cohort argued that homosexuality was unnatural because it didn't occur, according to them, in the natural world. They said not even animals would would engage in homosexual behavior. Um, so there was uproar from all sides uh, about this finding, the discovery that um, 
there were homosexual pairings among these seagulls. Um, and a lot of these beliefs about homosexuality being unnatural can be traced back to this guy, uh, Thomas Aquinas, who uh, in the 13th century wrote that uh, homosexuality is a quote, crime against nature. And everybody in the Western world took that and ran with it um, to the extent that when scientists did encounter homosexual behavior, it was dismissed or it just went unpublished. For example, uh, in 1834, when the entomologist August Kelch um, observed two male cockchafer beetles going through the motions of mating, um, and this was one of the first times an observation like this was published, entomologists were fascinated and scrambled for any explanation. Uh, most concluded that one male was being mistaken for a female, but one colleague who suggested that maybe it was just a preference was ostracized by his colleagues. I know the scientists were just trying to learn about the world as they understood it, according to the world they'd grown up in. So this little verse is, is kind of tongue in cheek, but um, there's a lot more examples. Um, in 1911, George Murray Levick um, observes what he described as depraved behavior between uh, uh, Delhi penguins. Um, and another biologist named Valerius Geis in the 1960s um, witnessed homosexual behavior uh, between bighorn sheep. Um, and he wrote that he believed the sheep were too magnificent to be gay, is his word. Um, but later he admitted that, quote, the Rams lived in essentially a homosexual society. Uh, another study I found, it was published in 1987, I think this one was uh, a little bit of a joke, but the title was A Note on the Apparent Lowering of Moral Standards in the Lepidoptera. But after this research on the gulls was published, uh, research on homosexuality in the animal kingdom exploded. We had a lot of examples. Uh, one third of uh, lace and albatross nests are female-female pairings, uh, similar to the gulls. Uh, so they mate with males and then they raise chicks together. Um, between bottlenose dolphins, the only social relationship within bottlenose dolphins besides the mother and calf is between two males. Um, I, I did my best with these pictures, but I can't always guarantee that these pairings that I'm showing are same sex, but this is definitely a male-male pairing. Um, this website, whalescientist.com, uh, describes these dolphins as bros for life, but they are definitely more than bros. In fact, often 40 times a day, they're more than bros. Uh, on the flip side of that kind of describing um, like projecting what what we maybe perceive onto these animals, uh, animals that are sexually monomorphic, like dolphins, those animals that don't have a clear visual distinction between male and female. Uh, we these are like a the reason that or the, one of the reasons that it has been easy for past biologists to ignore or just observers to ignore evidence of homosexuality in animal kingdom is because if we uh, if we see two identical looking animals, uh, we're just going to, you know, mating, we're just going to assume that um, historically that they are a male and a female pairing. Of course, this presentation wouldn't be complete without bonobos, though the majority of sex between uh, bonobos within a community is uh, between two female bonobos. Um, and they live in a matriarchal society. So it has been found that uh, th these sexual relationships strengthen the, the social bonds um, between, uh, between female bonobos. And um, they have a reputation for being this really like calm, peaceful monkey society. Um, but meanwhile, 40 different studies couldn't demonstrate any adaptation for that uh, explained the frequent female female pairings in uh, Japanese macaques. Uh, so the scientists um, who studied these um, 
these monkeys uh, have concluded that there's no um, specific evolutionary ad adaptation and that they just want to. Um, so uh, sometimes it is a socially beneficial adaptation, but sometimes they're just feeling it. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, those seagulls that could kind of become a queer icon, uh, it has been found that uh, at the time that this was observed, there were fewer uh, males on the island. Uh, and so now that the populations are a little bit more balanced, there are fewer female female pairings. Uh, but it did happen, and it's still happening pretty much everywhere else. We got homosexuality that's been observed in chimpanzees, in lots of species of birds, including mallard ducks and warblers, in manatees, in giraffes, in rattlesnakes, in hyenas, hedgehogs, bats, and famously, uh, two chinstrap penguins at the Central Park Zoo about 20 years ago uh, adopted an orphan's, uh, two, two male um, chinstraps adopted an orphan's chick uh, and raised it. And uh, they were the subject of a children's book called Antigo Makes Three. Uh, and I could, I could go on um, and will, uh, but I wanna note, um, that uh, ironically, in response to the discovery about the seagulls that George and Molly Hunt made in the 70s, uh, of course, they got a lot of vitriolic letters and a lot of them said, you know, I can tell that uh, that you progressives are city slickers because if you'd spent, you know, even a day on a farm, you would know that this is perfectly normal. This is nothing new. So uh, it, it's been, it had been known uh, even by people who, uh, who were upset that, that studies on it were being published. Um, uh, so, so far, uh, these are all vertebrates that I've been talking about that we think of as having two immutable sexes, uh, engaging in same-sex behavior and demonstrating that is common in the animal kingdom. Uh, that's what we've talked about so far, but from a human perspective, based on what we understand about gender and sexuality, it, things can get much weirder. So back to my Jurassic Park slide. Uh, anyone who's seen Jurassic Park uh, has learned that some frog species can change their sex when there's scarcity uh, within the, the quote, opposite sex. Um, and that that's why you shouldn't splice their genes with dinosaur DNA um, if you don't want them to reproduce. Uh, and this is the frog in question, this common reed frog uh, that was referred to in the movie uh, that, uh, whose genes allowed the, the genetically engineered dinosaurs to, to change sex and, and mate. Uh, but I am here to bust some myths. Um, so there are two types of her hermaphroditism, um, sequential and simultaneous hermaphroditism. And the movie claims that uh, these frogs uh, were simultaneous hermaphrodites, meaning that uh, they can produce both male and female gamete types and change sex within the same breeding season. Uh, in reality, uh, there's evidence, but not conclusive evidence that this species of frog is a sequential hermaphrodite. So that means that as a normal event in this reproductive cycle, all individuals in this species change from male to female um, at a particular stage in its life. So sometimes that is after reproducing, sometimes that is after reaching a certain size, uh, sometimes uh, that is when like the, the dominant uh, individual within a social group dies. Um, so another um, example of sequential hermaphrodites are clownfish. Uh, and individuals in some species of sequential hermaphrodites like snails have also been found to have a preference for uh, for mates that are pre-transition from male to female versus post-transition. Uh, so some 
will choose a mate that still needs to go through the several day process of uh, producing male or female gametes. Uh, so they, they have a preference. Very cool. Um, and simultaneous hermaphroditism uh, can be because of scarcity, like we saw in Jurassic Park. Um, Here's a, a comb jelly, which is a simultaneous hermaphrodite. So it can change, but doesn't necessarily change its sex throughout the course of its lifetime. Uh, but uh, some simultaneous hermaphrodites, like banana slugs, uh, have both sexual organs at once. And when they mate with each other, they mate with both sexual organs at the same time. Um, earthworms are also simultaneous hermaphrodites. and uh, almost 2% of humans, about 1.7% of human babies are born with some form of simultaneous hermaphroditism. Uh, it's not always visible. And when it is, uh, medical interve intervention is usually taken, whether that infant wants it or not. Um, and I'm just gonna move back to vertebrates just for one second. Uh, and talk about um, the New Mexico whiptail lizard. Um, well, I'm moving my thumbnail around the screen so I can see. Okay, uh, so within the New Mexico whip whiptail lizard species, there are only females, only females. Uh, no males are ever born. Um, and these uh, lizards will simulate mating with each other, which increases their fertility, and then they'll produce the type, twice the number of chromosomes they have in their body and recombine those into a new combination in order to, uh, to increase genetic diversity within the species. And then uh, they'll lay eggs that are reproduced asexually in that way. Uh, a lot of uh, reptiles are also, uh, also don't have sex chromos chromosomes and they're, sex is determined based on the heat of the location where their eggs are being incubated. So a warmer temperature uh, will result in a female and a lower temperature will result in a male. This is something that uh, biologists are having to consider uh, in terms of uh, mitigating climate change because we are seeing like more, for example, green sea turtles being born female on these beaches that are increasing in temperature. Uh, as we saw in an earlier Backyard Naturalist this summer, uh, aphids are only female during the summer and they just give birth, live birth, to a sequence of exact clones of themselves for several generations and then eventually uh, they start laying eggs again. Uh, there are males and females uh, in the fall and they uh, return to reproducing sexually. And that's just the animal kingdom. Uh, I could keep going um, if we had all day, um, but for now I'll just share that the split gill mushroom has about 20,000 distinct sexes uh, that have been, have been identified. Um, Uh, so with our definition of queerness within human society as anything that falls outside of our norm of this binary of uh, male and female and uh, corresponding to uh, biologically male and female bodies um, and outside of our norm of heterosexuality, uh, then everything, just about everything in nature falls outside of that norm, right? Which means everything in nature is queer, which is to say in a way that nothing is queer, right? If queerness is a norm, then everything is just normal. Uh, and I belong to the school of thought that also believes that there really is nothing that we can determine about humans that sets us apart from other animals. So we are just as much part of this, this norm as any other vertebrate, any other fungus, um, any other jellyfish. Um, and I just think that's great. And I love thinking about it and talking about it. Um, but um, of course, I'm not the first to think of it. 
uh, queer ecology is um, an interdisciplinary social and academic movement uh, to understand nature through this queer lens, um, especially in terms of getting rid, rid of dichotomies and binaries in nature, even thinking about like, um, you know, the terms natural versus unnatural or, uh, you know, humans being in charge of nature versus being part of nature, just getting rid of those binaries. Um, the editors of this Queer Ecologies Anthology are pioneers within the field. It, it draws from, uh, it's quite interdisciplinary, so it draws from biology, it draws from feminist theory and queer theory. Um, and uh, I, that it could be a good starting place, but uh, for something a little bit less academic, um, it's just a beautiful piece of writing, lovely storytelling, uh, a mix of uh, personal essay, memoir, and in science writing, which is just my thing. Um, I recommend this book, How Far the Light Reaches by Sabrina Imbler. Uh, and for a celebrity within the queer ecology movement with a big social media presence, uh, if folks are interested in some kind of just fun, accessible, uh, content. Uh, I also recommend the drag queen Patty Gonia, uh, who is a, a National Parks uh, employee as well, um, for uh, for just some fun, some fun content. Um, and that's what I have. I am so grateful to all of you for uh, listening.